All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for coming on to my YouTube channel. This is Sarah. It's at carnivore.yogi. And I have Thankful Carnivore, or Brett, here with me today. So excited. Brett is one of the first people that I listened to um, when I was making a decision about trying out carnivore diet. I heard him on the carnivore cast. I will never forget it. And his story about how he struggled with his mental health um, just touched me and really kind of put me over the edge and, and made me make that decision to give this a shot. You know, I just, his words were so powerful. So it's an honor to have you here today and talk with you, Brett, today about your story, um, about the carnivore diet. You're still going strong. And uh, so I'm excited to, to talk with you today. Thank you so much for taking the time out. Well, th thank you so much for having me, Sarah. I, I had no idea that you heard me there first. And yeah. that's what a blessing just knowing that is. Uh, I, that's why I share my story. It's become my vocation pretty much. And uh, I'm really happy to know that. You have no idea. That, that kind of information just keeps me going through. Whatever the next hurdle is, I can think, well, hey, it helps Sarah. I just got to keep going. Aww. Wow. Well, tell everyone, you know, what life was like before you started the carnivore diet, um, history with that diagnosis, just what you struggled with. And okay. then we can jump into more. All right. I uh, grew up in a classic <laughs> sad diet, standard American <laughs> diet. My mom and dad had an enormous vegetable garden. We had fresh vegetables year round. If they weren't picked that day, they were eating. Mom and dad had canned them. We had fresh potatoes underneath the house year round. And we ate a ton of meat. I mean, we weren't, you know, it was, wasn't vegetarian or vegan. We was textbook standard American diet. And uh, out of the four of us, my dad survived prostate cancer. And unfortunately, he's now at the end of his journey with end stage renal disease brought on by 20 plus years of type 2 diabetes oh, that wow. he was never told could be reversed. Um, my sister suffered, suffers from ulcerative colitis. My mom's not had any of the big name illnesses, but she's had a couple of three dozen surgeries and little things, gallbladder, just all kinds of issues. And then I suffered from mental illness for over 40 years, wow. depression, anxiety, and insomnia. Um, depression for me, I was a it was an extreme dissatisfaction with everything. Mm. Nothing was ever good enough. I wasn't good enough. Um, and if only I had, if only I had the iPhone Seven Plus, Sarah, my life would be so much better. <laughs> I would get the iPhone Seven Plus, and my life still sucked. Right. But then I had something else to be angry and resentful for. Woe is me. Woe is me. And all of that sat on top of an enormous pit of dark sadness. Mm. I was a very angry, depressed person to the point to where there's a picture on my Instagram of my wife and I, we rescued this dog. And we both remember that day as being a good day. Yeah. See that picture? I look like I'm ready to go postal. Like I'm, I'm, I'm at my last, on my last nerve oh. and ready to commit violence upon the world. <laughs> And I was in a good mood. Wow. That's how deeply sick I was. And more so, my, my diagnosis, I was first diagnosed in 1990 at River Park Hospital in Huntington, West Virginia. My life had become very unmanageable due to my illness, which I was completely unaware of. I worked in the mental health field for a number of years. And like a lot of people, I, I was blind to what was going on with me. And uh, I was first put on Prozac uh, in the hospital. It was very expensive, couldn't afford it, didn't stay on it for very long. But then in 1995, I started having these insane panic attacks. Oh, no. I, the kind that made, I was convinced to the point I was having a heart attack at one point. I smoked cigarettes then too. So that was my real reason for thinking I was having a heart attack. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I did the amulet, tried the whole nine yards, and there was nothing wrong with my heart, which was a good thing. That's a very good thing. Very good thing. 
but then it made me aware, okay, something else is not right here. Yeah. And I had a terrible, the first doctor I went to, he was not very helpful. <laughs> this was in the 90s. I was a musician, professional musician of no particular note for many years. I made my living playing music in clubs and bars all over the Southeast. And I had really long hair then. Well, he was convinced I was a drug user. Oh, no. He literally made me strip in front of me to make sure I didn't have track marks. Because I was exhibiting all the symptoms of, of a coke thing. I mean, it was never anything I was interested in. <laughs> so, so my opinion of the medical system started to deteriorate right around that time, as you can well imagine. And uh, then I had a doctor tell me eventually a few months later, that I, I was driving and I, I, I thought I was having a heart attack and I thought I was going to crash. And then actually somebody pulled out right in front of me that day. It made it even worse. And, uh, this doctor told me, he said, you need to go on meds or you're, you're really going to have a problem. Yeah. So 1995 started taking Prozac and I was compliant. I knew from my own work experience that one of the reasons for chronic readmission to state hospitals is non-compliance with meds. They're expensive. People get to feel them better. They don't, I don't need to take that crap or they hate the side effects. I did not want to be one of those people. So I, I, you know, I kept my appointments. I took my meds as prescribed and I studied everything I could about them. And for a while I was okay. I, I responded positively. I'd have these periods of wellness, might be six months, might be a year. And then I would crater, usually for an unexplained reason. Sometimes it could be explained, you know, pressures in the family, pressures at work, whatever. But usually it was just completely out of the blue. Mm. Uh, fast forward to uh, 2006, I had a textbook nervous breakdown, uh, 2007, excuse me. And uh, I didn't sleep for two months, more than an hour or two one night. Oh. And uh, that was not good. Good. That was when I started hearing children in the yard when I was the only one home. Not fun. Uh, mm -hmm. They changed my diagnosis then to major depression with psychotic features. When you start hearing kids playing in your yard and there's nobody there, they change your diagnosis. Um, I got to sleep for two weeks. They get put me on this drug called Remeron. And Remeron is remarkable in that I probably gained 20 pounds in those two weeks. It's oh, wow. Weight gaining medication. Wow. Two weeks, it stopped putting me to sleep. And I went for another six week tear of no more than an hour or two. Mm. And um, my doctor finally stopped that with a drug called Trazodone, which is an SSRI, but it's used off label to help people go to sleep. I, and it, that was the last one I was addicted to. And that one was a bitch to get off of. <laughs> I was addicted to that one for a while. Well, I, I, I can't say that I was addicted. I never craved it, but I had to have it to go to sleep. I yeah. only took it at bedtime. Yeah, that's when I was uh, taking it. The one that became the real problem, though, was they put me on Ativan for the anxiety attack. Oh, yeah, that's the worst. Oh, yeah. And, and I was on it for eight and a half years. Oh. I was on Trazodone for eight and a half years. Oh. Wow. Um, they started mixing meds. <laughs> Prozac yeah. with Welbutrin, Prozac yeah. with Christine, Prozac with Lamactyl. And finally, he hit upon this drug called Symbiax, which is Prozac plus an antipsychotic whose name I cannot remember. I, it's hard for me to pronounce. That's why I don't remember it very well. And that stopped the free fall. That stopped my mood. from. The, that stopped the craziness from intensifying. The downside of that medication was I would sleep 12 hours a night. And during the day, I would have to take one or two two-hour naps. Wow. I was literally alone. Wow. Just an unfunctional, miserable lump. Uh, if you've seen the movie One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, Danny DeVito's character, I, I suddenly started identifying because I, I, I just sat around and you'd say something to me. And I, I, hey, I, I couldn't, I was hard to even talk at all. It was just like wow. everything nonsensical um then in the end of 2008 i got the notion that okay because that major breakdown occurred from a familial thing that was the root cause of it and i don't get into that 
detail was, but I started thinking, okay, that happened. Use your brain, Brett. Use your work experience. Let's let's piece this together. Okay, that's happened. You can't fix it. Life goes on. There's no. Why don't we just start working at feeling better? Mm. And around that time, I'm complaining to my wife. I'm huge for me. I weighed at that time. I was up to about two fifty, two fifty five. Wow. And I'm six foot tall. Um, I was complaining. I was like, you know, I'm going to start feeling better, but I'd really like to do something about this weight. Hmm. And she says, well, I've heard about this Atkins diet. Why don't you go look at it? And I did what I usually did then. I just kind of glanced at it and, oh, don't eat these things and eat all of this. Oh, I can do that. It's easy. And uh, I eliminated the starch from my diet and quit eating bread. And that was pretty and quit eating ice cream and coconut cake, which I had a deep affection for. Oh, I get it. <laughs> and uh, I lost like 40 pounds. Wow. And I got better. But because we were so ignorant and nobody had ever suggested to me, and I had never read anything that diet could play a role in any of this. Went to my 30 year high school reunion, had a good time and then uh, about may of 2010 i was like you know i'd really like to eat ice cream again <laughs> and you know if i get fat and gain the weight back well i just go back on atkins atkins isn't going away it'll still be valid sure and so i started eating crap again july of 2010 I'm at, on a Sunday evening, I'm at Mass, and uh, I'm a Catholic convert. Mass is very important to me, and in the middle of it, right before consecration, we're on our knees praying, and I get this red alert, not a panic attack situation, but a prescient, literally a prescient message in my head that said, if you don't get out of here right now, something very, very bad is going to happen. Oh, gosh. And I ran out of that church, which is <laughs> atypical, to say the least. And 15 minutes later, I'm at home, curled up on my couch, bawling like a baby, and I have no idea why. Ugh. And this is where this is where it really gets bad. So from 2010 to January of 2015, it was just a continuous slide deeper into the pit. Um, suicidal ideation started creeping in. Now, I never wanted to end my life, Sarah, but it was very insidious. Well, if you were going to do it, how would you do it? I don't want to do that. I'm Catholic. I don't want to do that. I don't even want to think about that. Well, it's okay, but if you were, we're not going to do it. But if we were going to do it, how would we do it? Right. Oh. It's a constant battle going on. Mm -hmm. And the worst part was I got so sick, Sarah, I couldn't accurately perceive my environment. Mm -hmm. My wife would say, my wife, who I adore with all my heart, would say, oh, it's a beautiful morning. <laughs> my illness would twist that, and nudge it and alter it to where I heard. Yeah, it's uh, it's going to be a real beautiful day. Sure. And I would be like, because I love my wife, what do you mean? What's wrong? Well, she would look at me like a crazy person, because I was. <laughs> what do you mean what's wrong? And she would try to interact with me as if I was rational. Mm. Well, you could just imagine the potential for conflict there. Yeah. The constant struggle. She couldn't understand me. I couldn't make her understand what I was thinking, what I was saying. And it was just horrible not just for me it was awful for her mm -hmm. said many times and i'll say it till my last breath if anybody's in a place in heaven it's her because i was very very hard to live with mm -hmm. and she stayed with me and god love her for that because i wouldn't have survived without her i was unable to work i literally i mean i was able to write i couldn't perform anymore i could still write and kind of record music if I hadn't have been nuts, I would have been a really good engineer. <laughs> but 
mental illness didn't make me good at anything. Mm. It had an enormous negative impact on every facet of my life. And 2015, I mean, I've been on, I was on Seroquel, Abilify. Uh, 2015, my, my psychiatrist told me, you need to seriously consider electroshock therapy and or a long-term hospitalization. Wow. I weighed 289 pounds by this point. And I don't honestly don't think I'm going to make the year. I'm not trying to end my life. I'm, I'm fully aware that mental illness, long-term chronic mental illness, shortens the lifespan. Mm -hmm. This sick person, it's, it's, it's not a secret. It's notoriously evil for that. And then you throw on all the meds that I was on. You know, my brain chemistry had been in a constant state of being altered for 20 years, over 20 years. Yeah. I, you know, I was in a bad place. And a dear friend that I was making an album with, like, like I said, I could write music just well enough to keep going in the studio. And I had this lady who's an incredibly talented vocalist. Her name's Kimmy Wade. And, uh, because of her, I'm alive today. Oh, wow. I want to explain how that came to be. She was just watching a lot of this, and she sees how horribly ill I am. And, and she tells me at one point, she's like, I don't even understand how you're able to do anything at all, let alone create music. And she, one day she says, have you ever considered cannabis? Now, as a musician, I wasn't familiar with it, but I had, I had a bad experience when I was young. So it wasn't my thing. I was the guy at practice, you know, rehearsals or breaks, whatever, you know, pass left, pass right. It just wasn't for me. Beer was legal. I was fine with that. Yeah. <laughs> so I did a little research and I saw some anecdotal evidence that some people were experiencing some improvement with their symptoms. And my wife and I were like, geez, at this point, what do we have to lose? Yeah, yeah. ECT was not an option. I had seen people, <laughs> I'd worked in a facility and seen people after ECT. I didn't want any part of that. I mean, like 30 minutes after the treatment. The treatment, yeah. No, no, no. That was never going to happen. And I was genuinely afraid that if I did the long term hospitalization thing, I might go in and never come out. Because mm. that's not uncommon. Yeah. Um. Anyway. <laughs> What do we have to lose? I secured, we, we secured four grams of flour. My wife went on the internet and found this can of butter recipe and she made these little cookies. Sarah, they were about the size of a quarter. And I was so scared of them. The little raisin, I call them keto cookies is what I called them then. Cause <laughs> they definitely, they definitely weren't carnivore. No. I was so afraid of having a bad experience. The first one, I just, I cut it in half. And 15 minutes after I ate that, sir, it was like a thousand suns had lifted off my body. Mm. I wasn't high. I just didn't feel like crap anymore. Mm. First time in years. And then about 45 minutes after that, the high kicked in. And I learned that cannabis successfully treated all of my symptoms. 1,000% better than any medication I ever took. Wow. I completely blew me away. My wife come home and I'm like smiling and engaging in a semi-normal conversation. And she's looking at me like, what the hell happened to you? <laughs> <laughs> Not what I was expecting when I came home. And cannabis became a daily part of my, or, or part of my day. And, and 10, 10 days after that, Sarah, I'm sitting down putting my shoes on and I realized my belly's in the way. Mm. My belly's in the way. Oh God, this is not good. And I started having a, a mini panic attack. I broke out in a cold sweat and I go and I look and I see myself in the mirror accurately for the first time in years. Mm. And I recognize how obese I really am. I mean, I'm a heart attack and a stroke waiting to happen at any moment. Mm. I told my wife, her name's Danielle. I'm like, Danielle, Atkins for dinner tonight. <laughs> no kidding. 
and and I immediately now I started on Atkins low carb as I understood it. Let me preface that I have not never been until <laughs> I started doing this as a vocation had any interest or knowledge or understanding of nutrition. I believed all the propaganda and the programming that you and I were raised on. Breakfast is the most important meal of the day, et cetera. Eat your veggies, balance matters, da, 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 da. Eat less, exercise more, all that crap. So I did Atkins very imperfectly, but I did it well enough that between that and I started walking. Mm -hmm. Half walking the dog a half a block at a time because I was very aware of the risk I was at injuring myself if I wasn't very careful. Mm. So a half a block became a full block, became two blocks. Well, how far am I walking in these two blocks? So get out the cell phone, got GPS going. Okay, I learned how far from my front door to a half a mile away was so I could start doing mile walks. Over three and a half years, I walked off 94 pounds. Wow. By the end of 2015, I was off all, all the SSRIs, all the mood stabilizers. By the end of 2016, I was off Ativan. That was not fun. Oh, I imagine. Took, took six and a half months titrating down off of it. Oh, and yeah. then the day after my last dose, Sarah, I woke up with vertigo for the first time. I had oh, vertigo God. for two months. And not the not the swirly kind. It was like somebody was just gently nudging me like oh. this, all the time. Not fun. Mm -mm. But I wasn't on the pills. That was paramount. By the end of 2017, I was off the trazodone and sleeping on my own with cannabis. So fast forward to May of 2018, that same lady that told me suggested I look into cannabis messages me and says, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, you got to go watch every video by this guy named Jordan Peterson. <laughs> okay, Jordan Peterson. So I go in, first thing that I find is, you know, Jordan Peterson destroys and with just plain logic and honest language, he, he, he just literally rendered this poor newscaster unable to speak. I'll never forget that as long as I live. And I just became enthralled with this man and very impressed with it because I admire him, not just for his towering intellect, but his advocation of being honest or at least not lying every day. Yeah. I believe in that very much. So I didn't just become a fan. I mean, I, I literally started watching Jordan Peterson videos regularly just to grow as a human being. I, mm -hmm. I believe he has impeccable integrity. And one day I'm looking through in June I'm look, of 2018, I'm looking through YouTube for a new Jordan Peterson video. And I come upon this 30 minute cutout of him on Rogan, where he describes how Michaela, his daughter, figured out through a torturous <laughs> set of experiments that if she only ate beef, salt and water, her depression and anxiety and arthritis symptoms went into remission. Wow. And then I learned that he suffers from depression and anxiety, just like me. How did he function at that level? I hope to get a meeting one day and ask him. But I mean, if it's anybody but Jordan Peterson, Sarah, talking about this, I'm thinking, eh, we're just yeah. going to something else. Right. Absolutely. But it's Jordan Peterson telling me this. I, I can't, I'm a rewinded. And did he really say that? I make my, my wife, I beg her when she comes home, I'm like, would you please watch this and make sure that he's really saying what I think he's saying? Right. Oh, yeah, he's really saying it. Well, I got to investigate this. This is Jordan Peterson telling me I could not, I could not, I could be well. Right. My next, my next discovery, <laughs> Dr. Sean Baker on Joe Rogan. Yep. And I... I that's, <laughs> yep. I watched the dietary portion of that probably 50 times because now I'm thinking this is too good to be true. Why didn't I know about this before now? Why in all my studies? Because, I mean, Sarah, I was constantly reading in psych publications and patient forums and things like that. But diet? Are you serious? 
It was never, never mentioned. This man was, he's another person, you know, Air Force combat surgeons here, they just don't let anybody do that. Right. To be an extraordinarily well put together human being to even be considered. Yeah. So there's this towering integrity part two. And then I, the next thing I come up with, Amber O'Hearn, Keto Fest 2017, explaining in a way that this guitar player could understand how we came out of the trees because mm -hmm. we started eating meat. And she explained how our digest, you know, I didn't even know I had a sequel. <laughs> right. I, I got a sequel. Are you serious? What color is it? And I learned enough. I look at my wife in July of 2018. I got to do this. Sink, yeah. swing, fail. I've got to try this. So July 16th, 2018, I started eating animal source foods only, zero carb. I, when I made the decision, I because neither Dr. Baker, Jordan Peterson, or Amber O'Hearn discussed how they did carnivore. Right. So I had done a search and I found the Zeroing It On Health group on Facebook, Charles Washington, Kelly, Kelly Hogan, who, yep. isn't she a trip? I love her to death. She's awesome. Is, I watched my first 30 days, I watched all her interviews. Yes, I, me too. <laughs> yeah. and, and God love her. I, I am so happy that she's, she's become a force now and she's got her channel going and she's yeah. doing more stuff. I'm really happy about that because... I mean, she's impeccable. Yeah, she's wonderful. Um, anyway, okay, let me make sure. I, okay, so I've started carnivore. Tend to, I learned how to do it. I learned that one of the reasons people fail in the beginning is they claim boredom. And I could intellectually understand that. Now, I never had at that time, even now, I, it's not like I have a favorite meat. Right. But I... I could intellectually process that. And I'm like, okay, so instead of just having a lump of steak every day, I should have two kinds of meat. And one of those should always be bacon because there's never been a time in my life that I had bacon with a meal that I didn't enjoy the meal in some way. So I think, you know, and it's turned out that's been the why for only one of the few wise things I've ever done because I've had zero cheat days since. I, wow. 10 days into it, I woke up without joint pain, Sarah, for the first time as an adult. Wow, that's amazing. I never considered, I've never been diagnosed arthritic. I don't think I had arthritis, but I had, I called it aches and pains. You know, I was 57. I'd fallen down a few times over the years. You know, I, I was the guy in the club playing lead guitar who would go jump up on the table. And sometimes the table wasn't cooperative. You know, you keep playing, you protect the instrument, and your body absorbs the punishment. That's just the way you did it. And then the next day, you can't stand up straight. But those <laughs> pain had accumulated over time. My, I had, my right shoulder was kind of out of whack. I couldn't even hold, put my arm up straight. I could only kind of do like that. Wow. My hip had started bothering me. All, you know, But I just thought that was what happens when you're obese and you get older. Right. That's what we're told. What we pathologize, you know, we make these things normal. I had the same thing with my joint pain. And I'm, you know, I was only 39, but I had a lot of aches and pains from probably doing way too much yoga <laughs> and working out way too much. But they all were like, oh, bye, you know, and I'm getting older and I don't have those aches and pains anymore. It's like, okay. Maybe there's something to this, like, you're supposed to feel aches and pains. I don't know that that's true, <laughs> you know? And now hearing your story, too, it's like that went away within, what, 10 days, you said? 10 days. I'm skipping. Wow. I'm taking two mile walks in, in the more early morning, then. I'm skipping down the sidewalk at, like, 6 a.m., laughing to <laughs> myself like a kid because it feels so good. Wow. And thinking I need to settle down here and quit giggling like a kid because somebody's going to hear me and the men in the white coats are going to pick me up for having too good of a time. <laughs> and I, I wasn't expecting that. It was beautiful. But then 24 days on the 24th day, I'm, on, I'm taking that walk. I get emotional about this. 
And I'm down about, you know, mile, mile and a half from the door house. And there's this couple of trees, oak trees, big old oak trees. You know how they grow down here in the south and, and all this moss and everything. And it was like somebody flicked a switch inside me. Wow. All the rage, all the sadness, and all the darkness just vanished. It just went away. Wow. And it was replaced by this wave of happiness and joy that genuinely has not left me to this day. Wow. That's so powerful. And, and it's the most profound experience I may ever have in my life. It, wow. it really is. And I mean, there it wasn't, you know, there was no angel, no angelic choir or anything like that. It was just like somebody flipped a relay or something. And, and now suddenly you've gone from poorly operational to mentally optimal operation for the most part. I mean, I was completely symptom free. Wow. Depression. The anxiety took five months to get rid of. Wow. Um, I, st that was a little longer getting rid of. And then the insomnia just gradually vanished over time. Yeah. Um, and I haven't had a down day since wow. life still happens. There's been some sad times, you know, family members get sick, friend passes away, but that's normal. Right. It's okay. To be sad when something sad occurs it's not okay to be sad when there's nothing wrong has happened and you can't get out of it. That's one of the big diff one of the big differences. Yeah. As you will. And I mean, every aspect of my life has been immensely improved just from the diet change. I didn't suddenly become some wise guru or I don't have some vast well of willpower or discipline. I just eat meat and drink water. Amazing. And and it's it's changed everything for the better. My wife is a month behind me in car. She's watching this. Yeah. And low car, after I lost the 94 pounds, she suddenly wasn't the skinniest person in the house anymore. So <laughs> low car. But she had arthritis, osteoarthritis in her shoulders and really bad in her hands from, uh, she's a screen printer. And a lot of us repetitive mm -hmm. stuff. But she was finally like, well, I need to do this too. Yeah. And a month, she started a month after me and 30 days after her, she lost the, the pain in her shoulders entirely. Wow. And her hands have almost completely healed. If she stopped doing the work she's doing, they would completely heal. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's tremendous. That's tremendous. And the one thing I love about what you do and your story is that you have kept this diet, you know, or way of eating, I like to call it more so, just very simple. I see a lot of people you know, overthinking, overdoing. And I've made those mistakes too. You know, you reached out to me different times through IG because I started following you right away when I first started. You're like, Sarah, you're overcomplicating it. Sarah, don't skip meals. Sarah, you know, like you're, you're like, this. <laughs> just call, don't overcomplicate it. So like tell everyone, you know, what you eat in a day. And I, I just, I want everyone to hear the simplicity because this has worked miracles for you. This is the kind of stuff that we, you know, we want that relief, just relief from that mental, you know, feeling of despair, the joint pain, you know, the weight problem. So tell everyone what you eat in a day. Well, I, I, I started out eating a variety of meats. It was like the first couple of weeks was steak, bacon and eggs. And then eggs suddenly stopped being satisfying. Mm -hmm. They tasted good, but there was just no there there anymore. Yeah. And so I ate a variety of meats until December of 2018. I ate fish. I had uh, pork shoulder roast. My wife would get these huge chunks of London broil and cut them up into steaks or make roast with them. And I always had bacon with every one of those. And yes, bacon with fish is delicious. Oh, yeah. That's one of my favorites. <laughs> oh, gosh, it was good. It's so good. Yeah. <laughs> then I, we walk into Sam's Club one day and, and, uh, 
go to the meat counter and I love going to the meat counter now. <laughs> but there was these tubes of 90, 10 ground beef. I'd never seen the 90, 10 ground beef before. And it just looked beautiful to me. It was like from all the, the ribeyes and the tomahawks and the filet mignon and all. That was nice. But this, I need to eat this. I need to try this. Yeah. And I found that it's the most satisfying meat on planet Earth I've ever put in my mouth, even to this day. And that's why since December of 2018, I've only eaten very lean ground beef and bacon. Mm. I only eat when I'm hungry. When I'm hungry, I eat meat till I'm not another bite full. I only eat the meat I crave and can afford. And I never, ever ever put a sweet taste into my mouth mm. that's all i do yeah i learned from the folks that one of the things i learned from zeroing on health or deduced was people get in trouble i want to lose weight my way right i want yeah. to apply the status quo false information misinformation to this way of eating and you just can't do that. Yeah, oh yeah, I've made that mistake, you know, of like let me count calories, <laughs> you know, <laughs> let me skip a meal, let me do some fasting, let me do, you know, it just doesn't work the same way. And in my experience, it was counterproductive, you know, in trying to restrict my calories and trying to fast and all that, you know, for me, some people maybe that, I, I don't know, that may work for them, but you know, it's, that wisdom of those zero carbers that have been around for 10 plus years. I mean, it's, it's good, good information. <laughs> you know? It's valid information. And, and they don't, they don't like come at it from, you know, I'm going to explain this to you from science. They're going to say, this is what works. And I'm living right. proof it works. And she's Kelly Hogan's living proof. It's work. Yeah. Dr. Lisa is living proof. It, you know, all these people who've been doing yeah. this in a shoot, Amber O'Hearn, yeah. they're not getting sick. They're not dying. They're not putting out a video at the seven-year mark going, I can't do it anymore. I'm going to die if I keep <laughs> doing this. Oh, my God. We don't see any of that. Instead, we see happy, healthy people. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why I, I do. <laughs> I got to share this with you. I remember when you were having issues. Yeah. And I remember at one point, she's not ready to listen. I got to stop talking. And that's what I did. But I would start, I would send you, tag you, and I don't know if you ever figured it out or wondered or anything. I started doing this thing where, because there was this, you remember this probably, there was this sudden fad, okay, let's everybody do a seven-day fast. Oh, yeah. The, yep, yep. That was in July. And, and I, I was like. So sick after that. It was awful. I got so sick after that. Yes, you did. I remember. And you and you fessed up in your story that you were having a hard time. And I applaud you for that. Yeah, I've tried to be as transparent as possible through all this, you know. You weren't the only one having a hard time, though. I observed that. And I'm just like, I can't. If I say don't do this, who are you to say that to me? And they would be right. I'm not. Who am I? I'm just right. another another guy. I'm not somebody of note. I'm not an academic. What do I know? Right. But I realized there's got to be a way to get the message out. So that's why I started doing the not just the daily count on how many days it's been that I've been eating this way, but how many days it's been that I've gone without starving myself. <laughs> right. Right. And and I, I, I think that's so important. And in, I as a I do coaching for Meet Rx, Dr. Baker's site. And I see it time and time again. Yeah. That's the biggest problem people have. Oh, I can do all that. Well, oh, I got no problem if you're only hungry once a day. Right. But first, you're three weeks into carnivory. You don't even have a clue what your hunger signals are really exactly. like. Yeah, exactly. You have to relearn all that stuff. I mean, it. and if you have emotional dysregulation around food, most of us have a lot of hormonal dysregulation. We have blood sugar issues. That doesn't resolve in three weeks. No. You know, that, that can take, for me, it took a year, you know, and it probably would have gone faster if I, you know, didn't tinker around with the diet so much. That probably would have been a faster process for me. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I could say at the year mark, I was, it took me until then to really say, oh, I'm actually hungry. 
or I'm actually full or, you know, it, and it really took me eating unlimited amounts of meat to get to that point. You and, know? And you're not unique in it. I think it's the case for all of us because we, the programming was so deeply entrenched, yeah. you know, Oh, you got to eat at least three times and you've got to eat at breakfast time and at lunch time. Yeah. Time. So we were eating by the clock yep. instead of by our natural, you know, genetically pre-designed hunger signals. Exactly. And no wonder we were a mess. And no wonder why it's so hard for so many people in the beginning. And, and you know, you're not the only person I've seen go through such a difficult time in the beginning. But thank God you stuck with it. And yeah, I'm so you're doing you're doing wonderful work now. Those mental benefits, you know, that never went away. It was like, if I didn't have to feel depressed and I didn't have to feel the anxiety and that stuff that I had lived with for all my life, you know, I'm like you, I had been on different times of my life on five, six different medications for anxiety and depression and sleep. And it was like a, a freaking chemical shitstorm, <laughs> just like all the stuff I was taking to just feel okay. You know, that whole year, that's why I stuck with it. My weight might not have been what I wanted it to be, but I didn't feel despair and I didn't feel doom. And so I said, there's something here. I got to stick with this, you know, um, and it was stories like yours that I was just like, okay, you know, this is legit. Like, this is real. Um, you can get relief from these lifelong issues that you've had with depression, and anxiety and insomnia, it's, you know, through this way of eating. So thank God for those stories and thank God for those zero carbers who've been telling their stories and being, you know, transparent with everyone else. So, um, yeah, <laughs> but uh, you know, some of us are more hard headed than others. <laughs> hey, I, I learned, I, there were some stumbles along the way. I made some mistakes out of ignorance. Yeah. One was I, when I truly learned I can't put sweet taste in my mouth was like six weeks into carnivore. We're at an earth fair store and there's this little tin of mints, mm. zero carbs, zero yep. sugar. Okay. Again, I don't know what I don't know. Right. And it's flavored with xylitol, which I now know is a sugar based alcohol. Oh Yeah. I took one of those little tiny mints in between, between the cash register and the car. My wife says, you're not being very nice to me all of a sudden. Oh, no. <laughs> and by the time we got out of the parking lot, we both realized something wasn't right. Yeah. And what, it ha what happened was is it brought some of the crazy symptoms back. I, what, what, not the depression, not the anxiety, but I was suddenly... What she was saying wasn't what I was hearing again. Wow. That lasted for like a couple of days. Oh, wow. Yeah. It took a lot of cannabis to get that kicked to the curb. Let me tell you wow. what. I didn't want to be like that. Right. For anybody, especially her. I mean, can you imagine? Yeah. My husband's been a psycho for all these years, and he's finally turned into a nice person. And now suddenly he's kind of like he was. Right. Her going through that. Wow. And so I really haven't put another sweet thing in my mouth since then at all. Yeah. And then I learned also, and I conveyed this to you after your, your, uh, you were, took a plane ride and fasted for a long, long, oh, long yeah. time. When I went to Bali. Yeah. yeah. And you had a lot of problems after that. Yeah. And right before that, I had started, I went back to work. I was able to go to work again. I was yep. such a semi-confident human being. Yeah. And I'm selling cell phones in a Walmart. They come to me. I was, shake your hand. That was an easy job. I was kind of good at it. But I couldn't eat when I was hungry. Ah. Uh. They had crazy lunch hours. And if you were dealing with a customer and it was lunchtime, well, you didn't take your lunch until uh. you were done. And you might be two hours. Might be three. Oh, wow. <clears throat> so two weeks of this and I come in here <laughs> leaning up against this very counter. My wife and I had started having a, a disagreement. And I remember thinking at one point, you know, we're expending a lot of energy here, but I'm making some good points. We'll keep it going for a while. <laughs> she'll eventually come around. And finally, she holds up her hands and she says, you sound just like you did five years ago. Oh, no. Any, any sense at all. And we were like, Ooh. oh, dear. Figure this out. 
And again, I wasn't depressed. I wasn't anxious. I couldn't perceive my environment accurately. Mm. And the only thing that was different was the job. Yeah. I could not eat when I needed to. Meat yeah. is my medicine. If I'm right. late for my medicine, I pay a price. Right. I, 12 hour fast in November of last year, I got some lab work done and I did a 12 hour fast for that. Well, the day after that, it's like six hours where that kind of creeped back in for a while. Mm. So now, unless somebody wants to pay me some serious money, I'm not fasted for blood work or nothing because this is yeah. work. Well, the blood sugar dysregulation is such a thing that we don't think of. You know, I feel like a lot of people that have um, these, you know, people being crazy out on the roads or people being unstable, a lot of that, and for me, is the blood sugar dysregulation. And my blood sugar is a lot more stable now that I'm doing carnivore, like a million times more stable, um, you know, but if I try to go too long without eating, you know, and push it, push past the clock or whatever, I will start feeling pretty angry. I will start being kind of unreasonable. And I think that that is just my blood sugar is a little bit too low. You know, I'm not a bad person. I'm not, but I'm, but I'm more sensitive to that. I think because of my history with depression um, and anxiety and, and all of that, I think that it, it plays a big role. So if you're in a situation where you're unable to eat when you need to eat, I think that that, you know, definitely could be a big trigger, you know? So yeah, paying attention to that. And, and some people do great with fasting and all that and OMAD. And um, I'm not refuting that data at all. I just think, you know, certain people, and I know myself now after a lot of experimentation, and it sounds like you do too, that we just got to eat. <laughs> you know? we like, it's our job. Eat like you know? it's your job. Got to eat. Yesterday I was you know, I was like, oh, I'm going to go to the gym after I teach my two classes and get in a workout. But I was hungry. <laughs> so I said, you know what? I'm not working out. I can I can work out tomorrow. I can put this off, you know, or I can do it later on. I have to eat. <laughs> it's That's how important it is. Um, it's part of my mental well-being. It's part of my mental health to, to make sure that I, that I eat when I'm hungry, you know. Um, so there's definitely value in that. Um, we can't argue with the results when we, right. it's like, I, I, you follow the directions, you reap the rewards, right? So right. We follow the directions. Yeah. Our lives are living through our lives are the reward. I mean, look, right. at, I mean, I'm so every aspect of my life, every aspect of my marriage hasn't just been better. It's been like from here to the sun and back better. Yeah. yeah. So, huge improvements and it's not stopped improving 562 days into it right <laughs> Every exactly. still continues to be better than the day before yeah yeah and i mean i haven't had a headache Sarah, since the end of july of 2018 that's not amazing. one headache that's amazing headaches aren't normal yeah, and we get we pathologize so many things. We pathologize bloating and headaches and joint pain and all of those things. And um, so, one question I do have: you mentioned getting lab testing done. Mm -hmm. What do your doctors say about all of this? You know, being off the meds and you're, you know, you've lost so much weight, and now I see you're in the gym building muscle, looking really good. Mm -hmm. Tell me what doctors your doctors have said, how your blood work is, all of that. What, what's that been like? Well, in 2016, there was the white chocolate binge. White <laughs> chocolate became available at very affordable prices in our area at the Dollar General store, no less. And I tried to eat all the white chocolate in Duval County, Florida. And if I'd had a little more money, I might have succeeded. But I, I, I had to go get a physical or no, I know what it was. I wasn't, I wasn't completely off the trazodone yet. And I went to get a refill. That's why I had to go back to the doctor, get blood work on me. Oh, your blood sugar is like 200. You're pre-diabetic, your blood pressure. I, it was a classic anxiety, blood pressure, 135 <laughs> over 85, which just textbook anxiety. 
and, and oh, we need to put you on a statin. Oh gosh. And I looked at him and I, I just didn't, it was another one of those prescient moments of, no, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> Warning in my head said, no, don't you dare say yes to this. And I said, well, I'll, give me six months and I'm going to attack it with diet and exercise. Because I was walking, but I could do more. Right. I was playing at it by this point. I felt better. I'd lost a bunch of weight, but I hadn't really committed as hard as I could. Yeah. He said, look me right in the eye, Sarah. He said, 90% of the people with your numbers can't change them with diet and exercise. Wow. And I thought, you little snarly SOB, watch what happens. I yep. thought, I'll die trying That's to challenge right there. <laughs> yep. I haven't been back to seeing since because I haven't needed to. Wow. That's I have amazing. not seen a physician since that day. I have not needed to. Wow. If I need to see one, I won't have a problem. You know, I break my arm. I'm going to go to the damn doctor and let him put a cast on it. You know, right. if I suddenly start passing out or start, you know, bleeding from I'm going to go see the doctor and find out what's wrong. It ain't going to be him. Nope. <laughs> I thought about if I could afford to just burn a hundred bucks or a couple hundred bucks, I would make an appointment. He would send me to get lab work done. And then I would just sit there and giggle at it going, I guess I'm in the 10% now, doc. There you go. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, but I'll never do that. He yeah. won't change. He was, he, I knowing what I know now about statins and doctors and drug yeah. salesmen and things like that. He wasn't one of the good guys. No, definitely not. And, uh, but I, I, my blood work, my, my A1C was, was 5.4. Wow. Uh, somebody else paid for the test. I, I, I've been doing this for ever since I started carnivore. If somebody wanted to pay for the test. I would go get them done and I would share the results across my social media. Wow. My, uh, he wanted to know my, he was a doctor and he was curious about my vitamin D. I'm like, I live in Northeast Florida. Oh, better be good. <laughs> you want to know what my vitamin D is, buddy? I'll, and you're paying for the test. We'll find out. Well, naturally my vitamin D, like 30 to a hundred is, is the realm, the range. And I was I my, just a bunch of blood work. Yep. My I was 54. Oh, that's my, awesome. My vitamin that's, D is not a problem. That's my great. triglycerides were triglyceride cholesterol ratio was 2.5 awesome that's amazing that's so good i have <laughs> i have the lipids of a 20 year old guy that's amazing <laughs> that's absolutely amazing and so now i use that as a cudgel against anybody that's you know when the vegans come at me oh, i hope you like going to the emergency room because your arteries are so clogged Right. I think my lab work would disagree with that prognosis. Yeah, I'm actually doing right now, I'm about to hopefully release it this afternoon, a, a blood work video right. where I, I just got about, um, now I'm hoping this video does really well because I need uh, that money to pay for all these damn lab tests. They're <laughs> like, that insanely expensive. Like, I need this to go viral because, uh, but I just got everything done and surprise, surprise, it's better than ever. You know, like I have all the panels and they say, I'm doing great, no risk of heart disease, extremely low risk, you know? So it's like, I think it's important that we just, people like us just stay transparent and tell the truth. And it's so important. That's why I love what you're doing now with MeetRx, with, with Sean Baker. Talk a little bit about that and tell people how they can find you um it, within that platform and then also on instagram also well meet our ex is uh, dr baker is not just a physician an outstanding surgeon he's got he's, he's a bit of a visionary type person he's not looked at this just for the next year for the next couple of years he's looked at it in terms of the next five and ten years right site is going to be it, it is becoming he wants it to be the go-to place for all things carnivore mm -hmm. for free free information. Yes. All the, all the uh, meat heels testimonials are now there at meat RX along with hundreds more. Mm. He gets dozens and dozens of success stories sent to him every day. Yep. Um, so that's one thing it's a, a as an information 
destination. You know, you want to look up something related to carnivory, you can go to MeRx and look it up for free. Yeah. Now on to the end of time. Uh, but the community that is growing there is really special. I encourage you and everybody who's a part of this community to to come by just for those meetings because it's not just we have every day we there's a, a, a Dr. Baker meeting where he'll he'll answer questions and, and, and talk about things of interest and explain strategies for what we might as a community can want to consider doing because we need to get out of the bubble. We yeah. need to get out of our carnivore bubble so that the rest of the world can learn about this so that in five years the carnivore way of eating is not some fad or tiny right. little bitch. It's a viable, healthy alternative for all people to consider. Yeah. And then there's the coaching, which I yeah. am loving. I'm blessed to be one of his one of the carnivore coaches. You have to go through real training. You yeah. have there's real study involved. You have to pass a real exam. You have to get 95 out of 100 on this exam. Wow. It's not a, you can just pay your money and, and get a 51 on a test. And then you're yeah. A coach. And then they cut you loose. Now, it yeah, sounds you, like you're very supported and very educated. And then you continue to go to the meetings daily and you've got a community. So, yeah, I mean, I'm sure it is a very legitimate and helpful uh, service. And there's lots of meetings. There's not just the meeting. There, there's a woman's meeting. There's a yeah, couple. Yeah, I was of actually the speaker on. You did get to speak. You were you were the first person, I believe, to speak at one of those. Oh, cool! It was so much fun. I had such a blast, and then I joined um, that afternoon. I was like, oh, that's it. Like awesome. I get to connect with these amazing cool ladies from all over the world they're doing carnivore we talk carnivore stuff um sign me up you know so now i'm in meter x and i go to the meetings and i mean i just had a blast doing that you'll be a great coach too one day oh, yeah. no, doubt. <laughs> no doubt you will make an outstanding coach because you've lived it and you're living it and i think that's yeah. the that's what i see the coaches are people who they're everybody's living this way yeah and everybody came into this way of eating to fix one or more things. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's so important. And yeah. we're held accountable. We're, 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 you, don't, you know, you can be, we could be having a conference, a, a session now, and somebody could be watching in the background just to make sure for quality control sake. You're not, you know, I, I'm not ever suggesting somebody take a coffee enema to, to help their energy or anything. Right. None of that silliness. Right. And, it's just a beautiful community of like-minded people. And I think it goes to show, in my opinion, this way of eating, you take inflammation out of a human being, mm -hmm. there's a major transformation. Oh yeah, absolutely. In mindset and personality and willingness to listen to differing thoughts and ideas. Yeah. We could disagree with each other, have an hour long discussion, but we wouldn't be enemies at the end of it. Nope, absolutely not. Share a steak at the end of the day, right? Exactly, exactly. And, and I think that's so different. That's a difference between being a responsive person, whereas before we were actively sugar addicts. Right. We were reactive people. Exactly, yep. And, and I just, I think that community is going to grow and be a great example for many, many hundreds and then thousands and hopefully in time millions of people who, because it's about creating health. It it's is. not about managing health under the current status quo. Yeah. Oh, you're genetically, you got a bad roll of the genetic dice. You're going to have to take these meds for the rest of your life. Thank you very much. And I'll, oh, I'm sorry, I'll be unavailable next week. I'll be in the Caymans on vacation. Right, exactly. Yeah. Eat meat, drink water. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Where's it you, Brett? When, yeah. On Instagram at thankful.carnivore. Awesome. On Twitter at stickman bleeding, S T I C K M A N B L E E D I N. Don't add a G. And uh, I've got a YouTube channel, Thankful Carnivore. I do a periscope four days a week. I upload those to the, uh, to the YouTube channel. I have done some interviews. Maybe one day this yogi lady will let me finally interview her. <laughs> anyway. 
<laughs> I will, I will. And I'm going to put links to all of that below this video. So if people want to find you, they're going to be able to find you and connect and, and all of that. And, it, and I'll give you, I'll, I'll send you the link to my MeetRx page. Perfect. Uh, yeah, because I know there's definitely people coaching. that are going to want coaching. One of the great things about the MeetRx coaching, Dr. Baker made it affordable. 30 yeah. minutes for under 20 bucks. It's amazing. And That's you know amazing. as well as I do, 30 minutes for a lot of these places, they want 75, 100 oh, yeah. bucks. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. If you can't yeah. afford it, the greatest coaching, the greatest therapy in the world is useless. Exactly. Exactly. And I know Sean, he's trying to help the masses really get the message out, help people who are sick. And so I think it's phenomenal. And I'm super glad that you're a part of that. And uh, yeah, any parting thoughts or words of wisdom that anybody who's watching that maybe who's struggling, th you know, thinking, teetering, saying, maybe I'll try this, I don't know. Um, but still just really struggling. What words would you have for that person? You have nothing to lose mm. eating meat and drinking water. It will not hurt you. It will not harm you. What you've been doing all your life brought you to this point. It's time to try something new and different. And always remember, each and every one of us have something to be thankful for. It makes us worthy and deserving of being as healthy as possible. I love it. I love it. Well, thank you so much for coming on. And I really appreciate it. I know this conversation is going to help a ton of people. I hope so. It, it is my pleasure and my genuine joy to get to do this. Thank you for Sarah, having me on, Sarah. I, it's been a great experience. Absolutely.